Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 204, A Collection of Compromises, Board Games We Keep for Others. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. So tonight we're talking about games that I've got in my collection that I don't love myself, but that I keep for other people to play. After that, we've got two unrelated puzzle game reviews. First up, the Space Box from Escape Welp, and then La Familia from Puzzling Pursuits. We wrap up with our usual weekend review. During our shows, we mention tons of things. Mostly games, but sometimes also Kickstarter projects, publishers, past articles and episodes, and more. Find links to all of these things in our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 204, that's 204, once this episode is live. With that, let's get started over at the suggestion box. Welcome to the wondrous box of suggestions. Here we share a small selection of feedback we've gotten on our content in the previous week. Up first, we have a comment on our D&D Adventure Begins review. Martin Somerville says, I have played many RPG computer games, but I always wanted to try a sit-around-a-table D&D, but I'm rather intimidated by the thought of playing with experienced players. So when I saw this for sale in a charity shop for two pounds, I bought it and hope it'll give me some insight into board gaming and the confidence to attend a basic game. By the way, I'm in my 60s, so games workshop intros would feel awkward. Your review suggests that the game would be a reasonable starter intro for me and my sons when we have an hour to spare for an evening. Thank you for your thoughtful review. Oh, thank you, uh, Martin, and thanks for the comment. Uh, this sounds like the perfect fit for your particular situation. I will say that The Adventure Begins is not the greatest introduction to D&D 5e, um, it doesn't quite even come close to the, the complexity or things going on in the full version of the rules, but it does give you the basics of rolling a D20 and describing your actions as you take them and then checking to see if you succeed. I do hope the game works out to be a good gateway game for you and your sons, and if nothing else, you get some cool boards, cards, and minis for two pounds. Up next, a comment on our Pompeii review. Now, Estefania Garcia asks, does anyone know where I can buy this game? It's currently unavailable everywhere I look on the internet. I live in the UK. Yeah, Estefania, thanks for the comment. And I'm sorry to say it does look like this game is out of stock pretty much everywhere since we reviewed it. At that time, it was still available on both Amazon UK as well as Amazon US and in Canada. But that seems to have dried up at this point. And honestly, when we got our copy, it was from a discount shop. Like, basically, it's an auto part shop that got, like, a warehouse copy. So it was a warehouse sale. So to be honest, even then, the writing was kind of on the wall that this was a dead game that they're finally liquidating. Uh, at this point, my recommendation would be to watch the Board Game Geek Marketplace. So if you just go to the game on Board Game Geek, go to Downfall of Pompeii. And you scroll down partway down the page, you'll see a list of people who have it for trade and for sale. That, I think, is probably your best bet because you don't tend to get the markup there that you'll find on Amazon third-party sellers or eBay or other uh, non-gaming sites. It seems like the, the, the board game people are willing to give you the game for, for a reasonable price. Now, I also wanted to share this on air just in case anyone out there, any of our listeners in the UK, may be looking to get rid of a copy and could hook Estefania up or knows where to find one overseas. Well, moving on, we have some great feedback on our court content from the designer himself, Christopher Boothner. Uh, first, uh, first commented on our unboxing to say, thank you for covering the game and doing this great unboxing. I grew up with trick-taking games. Our go-to family game was Spades. That definitely played a large part in my inspiration behind this one. He then followed up the full review to say, Hello, Mo. I just read the written review and I wanted to thank you for such a well-written and detailed review. I'm glad you and your family enjoyed the game. All of your critiques were very fair and well thought out. If I'm being honest, I agree with all your points. 
I made a lot of rookie mistakes with this project, and I wish I could go back and change them. Oh, well, I will do my best to learn and improve in the future. Oh, and you're also correct. The term workshop is an embarrassing oversight on my part. It's a leftover term from the original theme. It was originally a steampunk theme with rival inventors, and the court was called the workshop. Anyway, thank you again for the well-done review. I will definitely send you any of our future projects you're interested in trying. Well, thank you so much for reaching out, Christopher. Uh, we always appreciate hearing from designers on our reviews and especially appreciate that Christopher seems to have taken our criticism of the game in good light and is going to use that to improve. That is awesome to hear. At this point, I'm looking to forward to seeing what they have to offer up next. Well, let's wrap up with a comment on our Space Box unboxing from Christopher Leary. Another of your videos convinced me to buy the Pyramid Puzzle Box from Escape Welt, and it arrived the other day. Space Box looks great, too, looks great too. Hey, Christopher, another Christopher. We had a gathering of Christophers tonight. That wasn't intentional. Um, I hope you dig the Quest Pyramid as much as we did, and I do have to say you made the right choice picking up that one. Um, before you pick up the space box. But more about that later in the show, because we are going to be doing a detailed review of the space box after our Ask the Bellhop segment tonight. Well, thank you everyone for your comments, replies, and feedback. Remember, even if we don't read your comment out on air, we do greatly appreciate any and all feedback and conversations that come out of your replies. Now, I think it's time to move on to the announcements. Our big giveaway has finally wrapped up. Yeah, this will be the last time hopefully you'll have to hear us talking about it unless you happen to be one of the winners. Uh, we did end up with over 4,400 entries, which I got to say is pretty good. Now it's going to take us a bit to reach out and confirm all of our winners. So if you've entered, be sure to be watching your inbox. You may want to make sure at tabletopbellhop.com is on your whitelist so we don't get stuffed into spam. Yeah, well, I might like eating spam. I don't want to hang out with it. Now, as stated on the fine print on the web page, well, it's not that fine. It's in the same size as everything else. But due to the number of people we're going to have to contact, everyone is only going to have three days to reply before we move on to someone else. Now, these emails should start going out after we're done recording, probably starting sometime tomorrow. And it'll probably take a couple of days to get through them all. We're really hoping to hear back from people promptly so we can get this whole thing wrapped up by next Wednesday. Well, that's it for the announcements this week. It's time to answer one of your questions and let you ask the bellhop. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron Jeff Seuss, who asks, what games do you keep on your shelves because they're easy to get people to play and easy to teach, even though you don't really like them that much yourself? Well, thanks for the question, Jeff. Uh, this is an interesting one that immediately had me wondering how big of a problem, well, problem's not the right word, how, how big of a thing is this? How many people actually keep games for other people to play? Like, is it common for people to keep games they don't love just because they know other people will play them? Like, I do this, obviously, and Jeff knows that, and I know Jeff does this, um, trying to collect um, more classic games. He, he's into to keeping the, the, the cornerstones of the hobby and, and the groundbreaking games so that people can experience them. So thus the question from Jeff, and it makes sense for the two of us, and I'm sure we could sit down in a coffee shop and go on for hours, but I do wonder how many other people do this? How many other gamers collect games for the sake of other people? Now, I, I have to admit, it's not something I'm personally likely to do. But even as I was writing that, I realized to some degree, I do and, and have because of my kids. Uh, yeah. There are games that they enjoy that I'm not in love with, but because they might like playing them, they get kept. They get kept around. Thankfully, Harry Potter clues not one of those. <laughs> yes, thankfully. Yeah, I'm wondering, but like I, I know my like I'm I'm trying to think of other game groups, and I know, and and everyone I can think of has at least a few of these. Now, again, Ian I know has a bunch, but again, he hosts public events, so it makes sense. Like, for me, it makes sense for the same reason, right? Because I don't just buy and play games for myself or a personal group of friends and gamers. I don't game with the same people, say, every Wednesday night that I have for years now. Ever since 2002, I've been more of a gaming ambassador, 
and as much about spreading the hobby to new people as I am about trying new things myself. Though I'm still all about trying new things <laughs> myself. That's the rest of the game collection. Right. Like I've honestly been running events here in Windsor for over 20 years now, which just sounds wrong to say, but I did the math and I'm like, wow, it has now been over 20 years since I've been hosting events here in Windsor. And because of this, over those years, a significant portion of my collection is based around running public play events and bringing games that I think uh, non-gamers will enjoy, games that are, are old classics, games that, that are just, just tried and true and everyone likes them, games people have asked for, and so on. And yeah, this includes some games I don't love. Yeah, and for you, iconic games might be a requirement. Uh, if you don't love a game, but it's one that everyone knows about and wants to try... That may be more important than trying to shove a better game down their throats and pushing them away from the hobby. We aren't gatekeepers after all. Yes, and that is definitely a problem I've seen with some hobby gamers that are like, oh, you you, you, you can't play Catan, it's terrible. You need to play this instead, it's better. And um, listen to episode, I think it was 199.5, where we talked about why the hate on Catan. So we kind of get into that particular problem. But yeah, don't be a gatekeeper, right? That's that's one of the reasons. If, if all my games were heavy Euros and I invite my friends over and like, no, this is what I have. You're stuck playing them. That could be a problem as well. I've noticed the chat room's already kind of blowing out with a bunch of them here, which is pretty cool. Um, Like Red Meeple Ryan has Catan and Pandemic because they can teach it. Um, Roger Dodger is noting that he reluctantly keeps Suro, Legendary Forest, Machi Koro, all again for new players. Uh, Danielle is mentioning Sword and Skull. That's another one. So we're definitely not the only ones, at least for the people who listen to our show. So far, I think that's everyone in the chat um, <laughs> who's spoken up. Uh, no offense to you lurkers. You're welcome to keep lurking or tell us games you own. I, like Deanna has a bunch, but by default. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's part of it. Now, what I will say, though, before we get into mentioning specific games is I both in an effort to not be too negative, but also because it's true. The games I'm going to mention tonight may not be my favorite games, but I do like them. And they are games that I am always willing to play or at least teach and, and watch and, you know, mediate. There is nothing in my collection or on the list tonight that I don't like. These games just may not be my first choice or even my 50th choice on a given game night when I'm sitting down to play with my friends on a regular game night. I can't say that's quite the same for me. If some of these games were in my collection, they wouldn't uh, wouldn't even be my 50th or at all on my list. <laughs> but we're there not, we however, going to support actively negative games, games yeah. that are objectively bad or hurtful to someone or some group of people. Again, we're looking for people to join and enjoy the hobby. Yes. Yeah, because there are definitely games out there that people have asked me to bring to public play events or expect to see at our events that you won't see me bring ever. This includes the obvious ones like Cards Against Humanity and other games meant to offend, as well as most social deduction games. Now, there's nothing wrong with social deduction games. I just really don't like them myself. Well, it probably makes sense to have a copy of something like Werewolf at pretty much any public play event. It's just not my kind of game. So those are the ones I'm going to leave for someone else to bring and teach if they're so inclined. Those are the ones that even wouldn't even be on my list after a thousand other games. Kind of like the ones on this list that Sean wouldn't be into. Luckily, we do have a variety of people. So for instance, Werewolf and Catan do show up at our recent events brought by others. And I do have to thank everyone who brings out games to any of our events and lets me leave my copy of Catan at home <laughs> so that I can fill my bag with newer, cooler stuff. No, nothing against Catan. Now, in addition to this list being games I own for other people to play, I also was thinking about this and I'm like, we could have rebranded this list as a number of different things. Because really, this is going to end up being a, a good list of games to have at any public play game night. Or a list of games every game group should own a copy of. But now again, if your game group is public, like if you only have five friends and you don't like Catan, don't buy a copy of Catan <laughs> just to have it. That would be silly. But if you run your events in the public and you have a, a, a meetup or whatever you want to call it, some kind of guild or whatever you get together, these are games that are like kind of like a good starter basis to have to start up a gaming club or something like that. Which, if you want to know how to start a gaming club, we've got an episode about that, but I didn't look up the number ahead of time. <laughs> we'll throw a link to that in the show notes. Uh, similarly, we've got ones about hosting public play events. And again, these games are perfect for that. Now, as yes. usual, 
This list is in no particular order. Mo literally typed them in in the order that they came into his brain, and they yep. are still in that list. Yeah, that is exactly how it happens. That's how it happens most weeks. Well, yeah. All right, number one, we mentioned it a couple times tonight, so we're going to jump right to Catan. I used to love Catan. I still respect Catan. And huge props to Claus Tuber, the designer who passed away just earlier this week, and whose shoulders we all walk on now. We wouldn't, this hobby wouldn't exist without the early work and, and continuing support Klaus gave to the, the hobby itself. Catan revolutionized and modernized board gaming. But not only that, putting that aside, it's, it's historical pedigree. It's still a very solid game to this day. It is one of the better Roll for Resources games. It's one of the, the few open trading games that allows trading with all players an unlimited amount. The only problem I have is I just played it so much, ranging from casual games half in the bag because we have a keg in the other room to playing in tournaments. I've personally had enough Catan. I generally won't bring it out on its own, but I fully understand that it has lots of fans and to this day is still a great welcoming game for the more modern board game hobby. Yeah, I've recently made my feelings about this game known. Not interested in playing it at all, but at the same time, it is a widely known game. It's a game non-gamers will often have heard of and can be very welcoming to them for that reason. If they see something that they recognize, oh, I've heard of Catan, maybe I could try that if everyone else I know has heard of it. That's a great way to get them hooked. Yeah, and, and Catan pretty much is in the public eye now, the zeitgeist. It's been on enough different popular TV shows and sitcoms that pretty much is everyone's at least heard of it. And true enough, I'll bring it out to events. We're like, oh, Catan, I've heard of that. How does that play? Second to me is Splendor. And similar to Catan, I played a lot of Splendor and kind of feel like I've currently seen all the game has to offer. And again, that's not to say it's not a good game and it doesn't have replay factor. It took a lot of plays to get here. The reason this belongs on the list, though, is it's even more approachable than Catan. It's, it's great for showing people that board games are so much more than just Clue and Monopoly. One of the big things here that shocks people who don't, excuse me, shocks people who don't know modern board gaming is there's no dice. That blows some people's minds. Catan at least feels familiar because you start your turn by rolling the dice. Playing a board game where you don't roll your dice at the beginning of your turn, boom, I have seen people's minds explode. Splendor is also fantastic for introducing the concept of engine building something you don't tend to find in mass market games where you're slowly building up an engine to be able to do more every turn and score more points in the end. For that reason, I keep Splendor. Now, I still haven't burnt out on this one personally, and I really should actually pick up a copy to play with my kids, as I think they would probably enjoy it. And one of the great things about it is that it's so easy to set up and get going mm -hmm. rather than many other games that they enjoy. And again, this also makes it fantastic at public play events because there isn't a long teach or a long setup where people are sitting around and getting distracted. You know, it's, it's really quick to get on that table and get playing. Now, there is a superhero version out there, and I know how much you love superheroes. So maybe <laughs> you need to get the Infinity Gauntlet version where your gems are the Infinity Stones. Mm, possibly. Next up uh, is Dominion. And in this one, I can't really explain why I don't like it because I don't get it. I, I'm not sure why. It just, it never really clicked with me, which is odd because I now love deck building as a mechanic. I like many deck builders that came after Dominion. But for some reason, when this game blew up locally, which was pretty much right when it came out, everyone was playing this. Everyone was loving it. And if it wasn't at an event, there were some specific players who always brought it. If they didn't show up, there was always something, oh, where's Dominion? Oh, you didn't bring Dominion this week? And I'm like, oh, sorry, that was Charles' copy, and Charles isn't here this week. To the fact that enough people asked for it, I went and bought a copy of Dominion and one of the expansions. But not both, because I didn't need both of it. I, I don't know what it was about this game. This, this is one that just never clicked for me, and I am certain of all the games I own, this is probably the game that has been played most by people other than me. Like, my copy of Dominion has probably been played by me three or four times, and I think Sean's been in two of those games. <laughs> this was the game I brought out and let other people go wild with. I, I Even though it's not my favorite, I do have to applaud it for being, basically for putting deck building on the map. Um, yes, I own StarCraft, the game that did deck building first, 
it doesn't wasn't the main feature though this was this was the one that that got everyone talking about deck building and the one that everyone copycatted and developed into what we know as deck building today i do have to applaud it for that plus i will still say this is the most pure deck builder out there for introducing the concept and it's easier to teach this than any other deck builder i've ever played so Fair enough. Now, as I played so many deck builders before I ever got to play Dominion, it hasn't lost its luster for me yet. But I also know that it won't take that long to learn the puzzle and be, you know, over it. Uh, still, it's another welcoming game that people may have heard about, or maybe a good game to help with if players are familiar with other deck builders the way I was. Following on from Dominion, I have another deck builder that I now only keep for when people request it, and that is Ascension. I loved Ascension when it came out, especially with the first few expansions, especially the one that added events. That, to me, was where it finally hit its stride. This was the deck building game that did win me over. This is where I'm like, yeah, Dominion was okay. It was interesting. Everyone loves it. Once I play this, I'm like, okay, now I know I love deck building. I like this mechanic. It, it, it swung me over to the other side. It had me sold on this new thing. Um, two things, though, have pushed me away from the game. Now, the first is the flood of content, the amount that was put out, and the way they released the expansions. And I say I love this set with the, the events in it. The problem is when the next set came out, it didn't have events. And if you combine the decks, the events became too few and far between. And then the next set didn't have events. So now the odds of drawing an event were silly, and they just stayed up the whole game. Like, they, they weren't designed to work with each other. But then who is going to buy Ascension and only use two of the sets together? Like, it just didn't make sense. Sorry, I said Dominion. I mean Ascension. Who's going to buy Ascension and just use these two sets, even though you own seven? So that is one of the reasons I, I kind of moved away from it. But the other one is the app. The app is still one of the best digital adaptations of a board game ever. And I still play it now and then. It's on my latest phone. And now and then when I'm sitting in a doctor's office or waiting in the car for someone, I'll pop it on and still play it. Now I keep Ascension for showing it off to fans of Dominion or people who are like, oh, I've heard of deck building, but but let me know it. So like, honestly, this is my next step game. If I hear someone say, oh, I like deck builders, I'll be like, oh, have you tried Ascension? If not, then I'll bring it out to the next event. And the other nice part about this one compared to some others is that it is a multiplayer deck building game, which is a little more rare than you would think at times. To me, this is a fantastic next step. Like, Plus, if someone's more of a fantasy and they're into theme, because that is the one thing that is definitely a little lacking in Dominion, um, going back to last week's topic. Well, I think theme is definitely part of it. And I know someone in the chat room called out uh, theme as being one reason you might not have liked Dominion. Uh, I think the other re is the uh, it's not a static marketplace, which brings a little yes. more dynamic to the mm -hmm. game and makes it a little bit more interesting. Um, this one, though, I don't know if I agree with you because I have never even considered buying this game. Uh, I can't even imagine owning a physical copy of Ascension because there's the app. The app is amazing, and it means I can play without having to figure out how to shuffle a thousand cards together in these unmanageable stacks. While I respect its place in history... Owning it, I would immediately sell it so I could buy the next digital expansion. Oh, fair <laughs> enough. I will point out that we have played the digital version at public play tabletop <laughs> events. So it's definitely happened. I, I forget what we were playing some game where the turns took so long that I started up a game of Ascension while we were playing. Yep. All right, next up, the chat's already kind of talking about this one for, for good reason. And I'm going to stick with deck builders. And this was just a logical progression. After I got a bit tired of Ascension, I then got hooked on Star Realms. I got to thank Wayne the Starfleet. Starfleet guy? Wow. I that. He's going to punch wow. me. If he's <laughs> Wayne the Star Wars guy. I hope he's not a uh, Wayne Humfleet. Wayne Star Wars Humfleet for introducing me to Star Realms at Origins, which I then immediately bought a, I think, two decks at the time. I played a lot of Star Realms, uh, perhaps more than any other game in my collection. Again, if you count Digital Place, I had played a lot of Digital Ascension until I got Star Realms. I loved the new combo system this game introduced. To me, that was the biggest, besides a non-static market, it was the biggest evolution in in deck building and one we still see to this day. Um, we The uh, Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade is, is one we played recently. They use a very similar system. I love that new combo system. 
and that had me hooked. But it had the Catan Splendor problem for me. I just played it too much. Plus, yes, I know in the rule book there's ways to play up to six, but really this is a two-player only game, and there are other two-player games I prefer. Now that said, it's small, it's one deck, you great to have at a public play event for when you have that one player who shows up late or has trouble getting into a game and the host can sit down with them and play a game of Star Realms with them to keep them occupied. And it's also great as a same reason as Ascension as a next step deck build. Like I have actually seen public play events of this. Um, like I own three decks of the base game where I brought all three out and had six people playing Star Realms, but not together. They were just in three separate games. Yeah, because it's far more manageable than Ascension. I think it really is a great next step. Uh, it's great for introducing new engine and combo ideas that people may not be familiar with from more basic deck builders. Uh, it's not a go-to game for me either anymore, but it's definitely worth keeping around. Yep. Moving away from deck builders, but sticking with a card game, is Hanabi. Now, this is another one I bought for the same reason I bought... Um, one of the other games I mentioned, sorry, uh, Dominion, which is it got requested so often at public play events that I wanted to make sure it was on hand. There was one local gamer who picked it up, but it was someone who couldn't make it out all the time. There were an infrequent guest at our events. And once they got a few players hooked, they were like, oh, do you have it? Do you have it? Do you have it? So I went and picked up a copy. Now, I do love the uniqueness. I, I love the concept of the co op where you can't see your cards and you can only see. Your opponent's cards, there's just something about this game I don't like. And I don't know if it's like my lawful good nature or something, but it's I think it's the way everyone subtly breaks the rules when they play and how each group comes up with their own language when playing. Now, I fully get this makes the game more winnable and therefore more enjoyable to some people. It just always felt off to me. Like, I'm going to hold the card this way, and if my pinky's over here, that means this, and... If I say the words like you have a two means something different than you have a two. I, I just, I don't know, bug me. Now, what I do enjoy, though, because of that, that evolving gameplay is watching people play Hanabi. I will happily show up, teach people play Hanabi and sit back and watch and kind of giggle at the ways they come up at how to cheat. But I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, I, I love watching it. If if people, especially if you, you teach them and they play, like they've never played games together. They don't know each other. And then you watch like two or three games in a row because Hanabi is one of those games you usually play a few in a, in a row and see that evolve. That is always fascinating to me. But it's a popular game. I keep it in my collection for other people to play and sometimes to watch them. As someone who's only played it digitally without any way uh, to have communication <laughs> other than what is strictly allowed by the game... Uh, I haven't experienced that house rules of cheating develop. Uh, I just love the thought process of trying to work out how to, you know, which of those communications to use, you know, who to, who to speak to, looking at the right. player order, the turn order, and trying to guess what the heck someone is going to think if you tell <laughs> them that they have a two. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I can see how this might wear thin physically for exactly the reasons that, that you've brought up. Still, it's a great game to drive home the limited communication ideas mm -hmm. on a path to other games that limit communication. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Next, the chat called this one, knew it was going to be on our list somewhere, and they're currently talking about the digital version, and that is Carcassonne. Uh, this game is a classic for a reason. I still enjoy Carcassonne. I played a lot of Carcassonne, but somehow never really got all that sick of it. I would happily wrap up our podcast night and go play a game, maybe with the digital version. The reason this makes the list, though, is that I don't actually ever play Carcassonne. There are other tile laying games I like more. Well, stopping tonight and going to play Carc sounds good. You know what sounds better? Going to play Isle of Sky or Land vs. Sea. Now, I don't have Xbox versions of those, so it might not be as easy to get them to the table, but I would rather play them. So in general, I keep my copy of Kark on hand because it often gets requested at public play events. It comes up now and then with long-term fans like, oh, we haven't played Kark in a long time. I'd like to play Kark and you bring it next time. Um, and again, it's there's a reason this game has the staying power it does. It's as old as Catan. I think it might even be a bit older and it's still people request it, still play it. This is a great welcoming game, and it's also 
very family friendly. Little kids can match up the sides of the tiles, even if they don't quite get the farm scoring. Yeah, another classic for some, although perhaps less awareness outside of the hobby, uh, unlike Catan or Settlers, which have gotten mm. a lot of, you know, big media attention. Yes. Um, it's still to this day a solid game with some great design. And unless you've gone wild and bought every single expansion, it can be a very welcoming game for newcomers. I will admit this is one of the few games I actually own two copies of. One is just the base game, and the other is my Kark with all of the expansions tossed in together. So I actually have two copies of them. It's because another gamer I knew locally was getting out of games and gave me a copy. But I'm like, I kept both because now I have Kark for beginners and Kark with the rules I like. And uh, I, there are some of those expansions I prefer. And D points out uh, Kark was from 2000, so it's actually five years younger than five years. Uh, Catan. Younger than Catan. Okay, I couldn't remember the order. For a while there, if you Googled or asked anyone, what what are the best hobby board games? You always got Kark, Catan, and Ticket to Ride. Or, or not Ticket to Ride, sorry, Power Grid. Those were like the three that everyone mentions you had to try. And I don't know if that's still around. I, I still I still hear Catan, that's for sure. But now you hear Catan, Kark, and Ticket to Ride is what I hear more often. But I still hear Kark getting called out. All right, next I have Roll For It. I first tried this game at Origins doing it during a demo where someone who was obviously throwing the game... Um, which I will admit probably colored my opinion of the game a bit and didn't think too much of it. But then I got a copy as a gift because it's one of those games where people don't be like, oh, you're a gamer. I found this cool dice game somewhere because you can find it at um, especially educational stores. So I got a copy as a gift and I gave the game another shot. And I found a very simple to teach, highly random game that was super approachable. Like this is to me almost like a Racco level of game. Like, I prefer more depth to my games in general, but I learned this is a fantastic game for new gamers. The basic concept is so simple. Roll your set of dice, put the dice on cards. If you fill a card, you get to keep it for points. You've got decisions like, do you push your luck and go for a high-scoring card, but you need all sixes? Or do you grab a bunch of easy cards that let you keep your dice in play and keep you rolling? I think it was playing this with my kids that really convinced me this is great for public play events, especially one that's in public as opposed to, say, a hobby game store or a comic book store. Like if you're in a coffee shop or you're at a, a pub, just the, the sound of the rolling dice, people tend to get excited. It's dice rolling. There's tension. You're like, yeah, I got my six sixes. It, it, it's a great for drawing in a crowd. So I have to admit, despite not enjoying it at first, I find Roll For It a great game for others to enjoy. I've never actually played this one, but... Dice placement is such a great man mechanic. So while I think I might tire of this one somewhat swiftly, it's a great bridge to introduce the mechanic so that it's familiar when you want to get someone interested in those more advanced dice placement games. Next, I have Suro. I think like most gamers out there, I was hooked on Suro for about a week. Maybe it lasted two. It looks great, the components are awesome, the gameplay is super simple. While the lure wore off quickly for me, I still see the appeal of this game as one of the best welcoming games out there, as well as being one of those unique, hey, look what board games can do that are different from what you grew up with. Now, the added bonuses here are the fact it plays up to eight players. This is fantastic for bigger events where you get large groups that want to play stuff together. Personally, I'm all about split up into groups of three and we'll all play different games, but I know there's those gamers out there like, let's all do something together. That's where games like Suro come in. The other thing I liked about this one is that it is a great filler between for between games because it's super short. Like 15 minutes might be a long game of Suro in some cases. What I used to like to do with this one is I would bring out my copy of Suro and put it at some type of standing table where people can stand around it, set it up, and whenever a table wrapped up, and they're kind of waiting for other games to end, I would bring those gamers over and quickly teach them the game. And then throughout the night, anyone who's just trying to kill some time could go over to the Suro table and get in a couple rounds of Suro. Now, I'm not sure if I should even say that I haven't played this one. <laughs> now, does that mean I have to lose my board gamer card? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. This is one of those ones that came out when you weren't down here board gaming with us, and, well, you missed that two-week window where we're like, <laughs> yeah, you got to play Suro. So I'm starting to feel that we need another Sean Con here just to get you to try each of the games in this list you haven't played at least once. 
Though for the moment, we've got a lot of other games on our priority list. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Next up is Love Letter. I personally never really saw the broad appeal of this game, but I totally know it's a thing. This 18-card game is a huge hit and spawned possibly more knockoffs than most other hobby games. Like, not Monopoly, but there's definitely, I think, more versions of Love Letter out there than there are Catan expansions. Due to the frequent requests of this game at our public play events, I eventually decided to pick up a copy. Knowing I was only going to get one copy of Love Letter, I did my research, and I went with the one with the original Japanese artwork. That would appeal to me the most. It looked the coolest. Now, I keep that copy on hand for when people want to play, but it, at this point, it's been so long since I personally played, I've actually forgotten how to play Love Letter. I know it's something about look at a card, play a card, and then you're trying to have the highest or lowest numbered card, and you get to collect tokens. I don't know. The nice part about this, why this isn't so bad, is every time someone has requested to play my copy of Love Letter, they already knew how to play and they're willing to teach it. So I just kind of sit back, I provide the game, and I go, you guys go have fun with it. Yeah, no clue about this game, actually. I, I always hear about it. Uh, I seem to always confuse it with For the Queen, uh, it turns out, uh, which I also haven't played yet. But I do have a digital edition, so I should really try this out sometime. For all I know, maybe I'll love it and I'll start teaching it at Blood Blood Clay events. There you go. <laughs> it's definitely a popular one, especially with all the variants. Uh, my personal favorite is one called Luce Jefe, which is a, a, a Mexican luchador wrestler game where you're actually playing two cards and one's, one's who's in your corner. And of course you have all the manipulation of cards and whoever wins gets a little actual paper belt you can put on your fingers. That, that, that's, that's my favorite love letter clone. But that one's a bit much for nine gamers. So like, well, wait, what's going on? You kind of have to <laughs> have to know a bit more. Next, another one that I fell in love with, played a ton and then played too much of and got sick of, and that is Pandemic. I, man, when we first got this, we were going bonkers over this game. Like, I, we might have played 20 or 30 times in one weekend when we got this one. I was absolutely hooked. The problem I did find, though, is with that group, it was fantastic. Then the first time I brought it out to a public play event, it went terrible. This game can be very group dependent, mainly based on how pushy some players are. Quarterbacking is a huge issue in this game. Then, of course, there's the fact that now I have absolutely zero interest in playing any game about the topic of a global pandemic for obvious reasons, and I may never want to play a game with that theme again. Now, despite current events, I know the game does have a ton of fans. It is pretty easy to teach, and as long as you watch the quarterbacking from experienced players, this can be a good welcoming game. Just watch for that one player who thinks they know the game better from, than everyone else. Yeah, I played this game once. It did nothing much for me, and I've just never especially craved playing it again. It, it wasn't a bad game. It just wasn't great. It is another welcoming game that has a huge awareness in the public, if mm -hmm. not always for the best reasons. <laughs> Next, we have Rumble in the Dungeon. So I've noticed this list tends to have like two, a scale of I played it too much or it's a little too easy. And that's what this one is. It's on the too easy side for me. This is a case of a super simple, silly game. It's great for the right time and place, but not something I'm going to recommend often to play at home. But it is a great icebreaker, filler, or end of game night public play game. It also has the bonus of that high player count. I think this one goes up to 10 players, which again is good for those groups who are like, well, we got to play something all together. And this is completely, totally 100% family friendly. So there's benefits there. Now, I also have to admit, I do keep this one for the kids because they love this game, even though they're now in their teens. Yeah, this is, uh, this is another one I've enjoyed. Uh, but it doesn't really have the meat I'm interested in. Uh, while I wouldn't keep it, uh, I do wish there'd been a copy available when that family had been looking for games at that last public event. I think they would have really enjoyed it. You have to remember to bring that one on the 15th. Next is Skull. This is one of the few bluffing, somewhat social deduction style games I do still have in my collection and that I keep. Now, this was a traditional biker game originally played with beer coasters. 
Skull has players trying to one-up each other by betting on how many coasters they can flip over before revealing a skull. Now, despite its origins and roots in gambling, this actually has is a pretty solid family-friendly pusher luck game with a bit of deduction and some really nice-looking coasters. Um, to be honest, my daughter, when we were bringing up the games for our backdrop today, was like, ooh, Skull, I like that one. So there's a good sign that my oldest daughter had a positive experience with this one. Now, this is simple to teach. One of the cool things about it is it can play any number of players, literally any number, as long as you have enough sets. Um, it used to be you could buy Skull and you could buy Roses, and you could combine the two. But Roses seems to be out of print. You can still find Skull. Uh, technically, if you just collected sets of four beer coasters, three the same, one different, you could pull this off on your own. Simple to teach, plays any number of players. I, this is one I don't mind playing now and then. Now, I will say, despite the fact my daughter loves it and it's very family friendly, I find this one tends to get the most traction, though, at bar-based events with adult beverages. Something about that coaster theme and the skulls, just and then and then the one-upsmanship, I think, uh, gets that game flowing when there is alcohol involved. I mean, we've been talking about this game since very early episodes. It comes up yeah. regularly. Honestly, though, it's just not one I've even been interested in adding to the Sean Must playlist. It's one of those yeah. games that I'll probably get around to playing at some point. But uh, overall, it's not really a theme that uh, has attracted me and, and wouldn't be in my collection for that reason. And we have Roger in the chat. Love Skull goes great with beer. See, <laughs> that's that's pretty much it. That's one I don't know. That That's one I think that might win you over if we actually sat you down to play it. If we had enough people. And people have to be into it, too. That's part of it. I, I, I what the, My one hatred in Skull is when someone shuffles their tiles instead of intentionally picking where to hide the Skull. That that just ruins it for me. I'm like, you made the game random. Don't make it random. <laughs> like, like, bluff. Pretend you're shuffling them maybe in bluff. But yeah. All right, number 15, this is my last board game for the night, and the one we'll probably get the most flack for, Mo at TabletopBellHop.com. Our chat room's already called it, though, because there are fans that know my opinion on this game. That is Ticket to Ride. You all know I've never been a big fan of this game, but I will play it fast. I don't hate it in any way. It's just, I don't know, not my favorite game. But the popularity of this game did have me seek out a copy for our public play events. And when I did so, I decided to go for the big anniversary edition. I figure if I'm going to own a copy that's specifically for public play, I might as well make it the edition that would catch the most attention and hopefully draw people in. Now, I will admit, since getting it, that is all we bought it for. My extended family and my kids actually have grown to enjoy the game. And it is one we tend to play a couple of years with the kid's grandmother and aunt. You just can't deny the popularity of Ticket to Ride and the notoriety of Ticket to Ride. I, I am clearly on the record as disliking Ticket to Ride. Uh, that's Sean at TabletopBellhop.com. Uh, I will actively say no to playing Ticket to Ride. But alas, everyone else seems to love it and be interested in it, so it certainly holds a place as a welcoming game for many. But there are quicker versions that you can get out there and get done faster. Yeah, this isn't, this is a, maybe our next episode will be if next steps to play with people who always ask for these games. There you and go. we can come up with, with a suggestion on that. So I noted this was my last board game on the list. And that is, I, I, I keep for the sake of other gamers. But since this question comes from local indie RPG guru Jeff, uh, the hippie gamer that he is, I wanted to toss in one more honorable mention that I am sure he will appreciate. There is one RPG I keep copies of, even though I haven't been a fan in years, and that is Dungeons & Dragons. Again, Mo at TabletopBellHop.com. While I don't in any way hate D&D and have had fun both running and playing it, it is not my system or setting of choice. The thing is, though, it's the system that everyone knows and the one you can usually get a group of four to six gamers to agree to playing together. Due to this, I have run way more Dungeons & Dragons than any other RPG, though it would never be my first choice of what to run. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I've got uh, actually a couple episodes. I had my, my second ed uh, player's guide sitting up on my, in my background. Uh, but I, no interest in, in what they've done, where they're going, continuing on with it. There are so many 
role playing games out there better suited to specific action and and, and genre that uh, there's just no need other than because other people want to play D&D to have a copy yep. of D&D. The, the thing I do miss the most is the public play aspect. I, if they hadn't changed Adventurers League to running published adventures and stuck to the old format, I would probably still be running D&D. That is the one aspect of the game I loved, but that touched the gaming ambassador in me. That was me sharing the role-playing hobby, not necessarily enjoying D&D. But again, I, you know, Major Kill in the chat just called out, there are so many better RPGs, but yes, we all have player handbooks just in case. You know, it's interesting, actually. You mentioned that, and were that going on now with me in Windsor and my schedule being what it is, I probably would go out on a Thursday night to play yeah. Adventure League. Um, yeah. at your table or at another table, just just to mix it up and 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 have fun. Uh, it it is a shame that 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 sort of group uh, regularity isn't there. Yeah, sad to see it go. Well, that's it for our list of games we've kept in the collection, mainly for other people's enjoyment and not our own. Do you have any games you keep because other people dig them? Tell us about them in the comments below. Now we're about to check in with the lobby, but before that, a quick reminder that we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, just like Jeff's question tonight. Get questions to us by going to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Ask the Bellhop, sending an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. No hate mail there. That one's just for questions. Or send me a message on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. It's time to check out another puzzle box from Escape Welt. This time, it's the Space Box. Before we get started, a big thanks to Escape Welt for not only providing us with a number of puzzles to check out, but also for extending our Bellhop discount code. As this is the fourth puzzle box we've reviewed from Escape Welt, we're not going to get into a lot of detail about who they are, etc. That's covered well enough in our previous reviews. All you really need to know is that Escape Welt is a German escape room company that shifted to making wooden puzzles due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Their puzzles are all laser-cut birchwood and include some traditionally flat puzzles, as well as 3D puzzles like the space box we're looking at here. The goal of each of these 3D puzzles is to figure out a way to get them open. And when you do, you are awarded with a small prize. After solving the puzzle, you are left with a keepsake that looks pretty cool on a shelf, makes for a great conversation piece, or that can be used as a very cool gift box and passed on to someone else with a gift inside. Now, the space box is one of Escape Welt's newest puzzles, and they let me know that this is the hardest one they've published yet, something I can't dispute. Uh, blah, 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 yeah, for a look at the packaging of this 3D puzzle box, just... Again, get a good look at the box from all sides. Check out our Unboxing the Space Box video on YouTube. Now, one thing that stuck out about this puzzle immediately upon opening it was how loose some of the pieces are. There are four sliders on the box that immediately upon opening it start to slide out and in of the puzzle. Certain ways of holding this puzzle just let things move, which of course makes doing intentional things with those pieces that much harder. I don't know if this was by design or if my particular copy of the space box was looser than it should have been. As I'll say this looseness did impact our ability to solve the puzzle as each of these sliders needs to be set to certain points at the same time. And you have to be very careful when setting one not to have another slider slide out on you. Now, I personally suspect that this was a feature, not a bug, but I hesitate to say why as we don't want any spoilers here. Very true. Now, other than this minor issue, the puzzle itself is very chunky and solid. Etchings in the wood were very clear and easy to read, and nothing felt like it was going to break just by playing around with it. This was really the first of the puzzles I hadn't felt any concern about breaking things. Now, this might be that I'd had my hands on more of them at this point, but there was <laughs> also something about its assembly that was just reassuring. Now, this one feels very solid and well put together. Now, except for the fact that some sliders pop out at you right away, there's no real indication on this box where to start at all. Of all the Escape Well puzzle boxes we played with and managed to solve, this one had us stumped the longest. Literal weeks went by with me, Sean, my wife, my kids, and our friends fiddling around with this thing on and off 
until I finally realized what to do first. Now, once we got that going, we started making progress until we got completely stuck again. Then, at one point later, a piece popped out that hadn't before. And from then on, it actually wasn't much longer before I'd solved the puzzle and gotten to the prize, which was pretty typical of these puzzles. While it felt good finally getting the puzzle open, it just wasn't as rewarding as solving, say, the quest pyramid, because we had no idea what we did to make that one piece suddenly pop out. One minute, we're flipping things around, and suddenly there's a bit sticking out that wasn't there before. It wasn't until I went online to check the proper solution that I learned that there's an entire part of the, part of the puzzle that we basically skipped and solved by accident. Yeah, this was a bit frustrating. In fact, Mo had guessed at what was happening at one point, and I dismissed it as it had just seemed wildly unlikely that they would do something like that. And boy, was I wrong. Yeah, there is a bit of engineering in this that's pretty dang clever. Now, to add to this, though, this part of the puzzle, we wasted at least an hour thinking we hadn't solved it yet and still had things to do. Here we were manipulating things, expecting something to happen, but nothing was. And that's because we had already done the thing without knowing it. These unintentional solutions are really a frustration in these puzzles. Though luckily, they don't happen too often. Yeah. This one in particular, however, I think might pop up more often than most. Now, on a more positive note, I think it would have been near impossible to brute force this puzzle or solve the whole thing by luck. Trust me, we tried on a few parts when we were stuck, mixing different possible combinations and trying to lockpick things by feeling how manipulating one part might make another part jiggle to think it's in the right place or wrong. And this got us nowhere. While we did somehow manage to accidentally solve one part of the puzzle, you're going to need logic to actually finish this and get it open. Indeed, one aspect of this puzzle would require trying about 1,300 combinations to brute force, and the laser-etched birch has enough of a flex to it that you don't get the sort of feedback you might expect if you are trying to pick something by touch. Uh, you know, that the, when, you, when, you, when you move the, the latch, things move that wouldn't move if it was like, a for instance, a solid metal key, uh, something. Right. Now, one interesting thing about this puzzle is by the end, you technically end up with two compartments you could hide gifts in. One of these is open before the other, and this could make for a cool mid-puzzle surprise, or perhaps a hint at what you put in the main compartment if you use this as a gift box. Now, as a bonus, if you are thinking of picking up this puzzle box just to use it as a gift box, and have no interest in solving yourself, for this one, you can find a short video on Escape Vault's website that tells you how to get in and out in under 30 seconds. Now, who do you think should be looking to pick up a copy of this 3D puzzle? When the rep from Escape Vault noted this was their hardest puzzle yet, they weren't kidding. Of all the boxes, this one took the longest to get open by far, taking weeks longer than the others. At this point, my kids still haven't figured out how to open it and have seemingly given up on it for now, though I'm sure at some point they'll notice it sitting on a shelf, pick it up, and start playing with it again. This puzzle really was baffling at first, and tempted me to look up some form of hints. Now, while a full space box solution can be found on the Escape Welt site, and it's broken up so you don't solve the whole thing at once, I didn't want to use that if possible. So what we did instead when we were stuck is we googled specific hints especially on one specific puzzle, and that was the one that we found out we had already accidentally solved part of it. And once we stopped trying to find a solution we already had, the rest of the puzzle started to fall into place. Now, the nice thing is that you can look at the title of the different hints and know just from that what you have or haven't solved. And that was all that was really required. Not the mm -hmm. steps, but the concept of what you were trying to solve. Now, before part starting this puzzle, we had already opened three other Escape Out wooden puzzle boxes. And I think at this point, I wouldn't call us pros or anything, but we're starting to get a good feeling for how these puzzles are solved. What kinds of things you can manipulate, what you have to do, what can or can't or should or shouldn't be moved. And I think this really helped in regards to us getting the space box open. 
I have a feeling if this was the first box we got from Escape Well and I had played with this one first, I would have gotten frustrated, ended up looking up a solution online, at least to get that first step to get it started. Yeah, absolutely. This one in particular could be confidence wrecking to a beginner. Due to this, I don't think the space box makes for a good intro to this style of puzzle. This is not a beginner box. To me, the space box is for experienced puzzle box fans looking for a challenge. I can't see this being a good first wooden puzzle box experience. Now, if you are looking for more of an entry level box, then I recommend the Quest Pyramid, which we reviewed a couple weeks back. It was much more straightforward in how it had to be solved and walks you through the steps and makes you feel good right away for getting that first answer quickly. Now, once you figured that one out, maybe then you can move on to some of the more difficult boxes from Escape Well. Now, the order I would suggest would be the Quest Pyramid, then the Fort Knox box, then the House of the Dragon, and then finally the Space box, which you can get all of those for 10% off if you use our code BELLHOP over at EscapeWell.com. That's B-E-L-L-H-O-P. Now, that's a solid set and should give you plenty to work with as well as great things to leave around and confound your house guests with. Now, what I don't know is they have some bundles of these puzzles, and I don't know if you can get those particular four in a bundle, but that is a way to save some money. Overall, uh, we, our family, everyone who's touched them has had way more fun than expected with these escape boxes from Escape Well. I've still got one more here to check out, but it's a little different. It's a two-in-one box where you first have to build the puzzle before you solve it. And I'm still not sure how they're going to pull it off, but where building it isn't going to give you the solution. But we'll see. This one's called the Orbital Box Times 2, and I am looking forward to checking this out as my next Escape Well experience. Well, that's it for our review of the Escape uh, Space Box 3D bo Puzzle Box from Escape Welt, the most challenging puzzle box we've managed to solve so far. Now, if you enjoyed this review, be sure to like, thumbs up, share, retweet, subscribe, etc. I also welcome you to check out my written review of this puzzle box over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to a review of La Familia from Puzzling Pursuits, who we have to thank for sending us a couple of their puzzle games to check out. La Familia is an escape room in a box style puzzle game published by Puzzling Pursuits in 2020. It's the first of three games in a trilogy, but stands alone as a single product as well, telling a complete story on its own. The puzzle game is designed for one to six players, though I think this one in particular is best at five. The game is split into two chapters, each of which can take upwards of two hours. Split the game over two nights and figure out the total time to be close to about four hours. The suggested age is listed at 14 plus, which seems a bit high. While there is talk of mafia hits in the game, there are no actual violent acts described, nor any gory descriptions or foul language. You can get La Familia on sale right now for $34.95 direct from Puzzling Pursuits, where it has a regular retail price of $60. Even better, if you buy two of their boxes at once, you save 20% off the second one. We would appreciate it if you used our affiliate link in the show notes below if you do go shopping there. It's Chicago, 1929. Al Capone was just arrested and there's a power vacuum now left behind. You are investigators contacted by the FBI to assist in their investigation into a gang called La Familia, a new gang that looks like it may be even more dangerous than Capone's own Chicago outfit. It's up to you to decipher a number of coded messages being passed between the La Familia capos and help the FBI find out what they're up to and stop them. For a spoiler-free overview of the components you get with this puzzle game, check out our La Familia unboxing video on YouTube. While you won't see any of the specific clues here, you do get a chance to see just how much you get in the box and the overall quality of the components. Yeah, unfortunately, without trying to spoil anything, there wasn't a lot I could go through in that particular box, but at least you see how much you get. Now, I will say the overall quality here is good, though really everything you get is just a series of different paper products. Um, these include multiple sealed envelopes and things like a newspaper segment, an invitation, menus, uh, posters, and more. Sadly, there's no neat stuff like watches, keys, or locks, or other physical products you sometimes see in other cape room-style games. 
Now, one complaint we did have with all of this stuff is that much of the glossy paper was not great for writing on, which leads me to another thing to be aware of with this game. You are meant to write on as well as fold some things. While it is theoretically possible to solve the case without destroying anything, you're going to go through a lot of scrap paper and probably some tracing paper as well. We started off trying to save the game so we could pass it on to someone else, but gave up partway through part one and just started folding and writing on things. Well, what is it we're doing with all of these different types of paper? Well, getting started in La Familia couldn't be easier. Gather together a group of players or sit down with the game on your own, open up the box, open up the big part one envelope, they'll you find a sealed leather, once read, will tell you what to do next. One big advantage this style of game has over traditional board games is that there is zero prep time required. There's nothing to open up, punch and sort. There's no minis to assemble or a thick rule book to read. You just open things up and start reading the first thing you see. Now, reading this will lead you to six puzzles. Five small individual puzzles that are independent of each other, and then a sixth meta puzzle that requires the solutions from the other five to solve. As you solve each puzzle, you're going to load up a Puzzling Pursuits webpage and check your answer. Note on that same page, you can also get some very well-written staged hints in case you do get stuck. Now, don't be afraid to use these hints. They are presented in small parts in order to not accidentally spoil anything. For each puzzle, the first hint just makes sure you have everything you need and provides a link to get replacement parts if something really is missing from your game. That's something we did not see with our copy. The actual solutions are usually three to five hints in, and early hints may just be the nudge your group needs to keep moving. Now, once you solve the final puzzle in part one, you put it in that uh, web page again and get a short story that continues the, the plot of the game. You're then going to move over to part two, which features another five individual puzzles and one final puzzle for you and your group to solve. Once you've confirmed the final solution on the website, the story wraps up and you're appointed to where to find more games as La Familia is actually part one of a trilogy of Chicago based games. Now, despite this, La Familia does tell a complete story. It's not like you're left with a cliffhanger at the end, though I will admit it did leave us kind of wanting more. Now, on to some thoughts on this Chicago based puzzle game. So having played Black Brim 1876, this was the first game we reviewed from Puzzling Pursuits, we all had a pretty good idea of what to expect from Familia, and all of those expectations were met. It, it did similar things, which to me is a good thing, because we enjoyed Black Brim quite a bit. Now, one of our favorite things about Black Brim is that it featured multiple individual puzzles that were independent from each other, which can then be easily split up between the players. This is also true of La Familia, with each chapter providing five standalone puzzles, as well as a meta, meta puzzle to wrap the end of each chapter. It was perfect for our group of five players, which included my mother-in-law, both my kids, my wife and I. And a real bonus compared to puzzles where each puzzle must be completed to move on, as with more than two players, those styles can get awkward with too many hands and not enough material to let everyone take part. Now, one difference this time around, though, is that none of us managed to solve anything on our own. Every single puzzle in La Familia got passed around and teamed up on before we managed to solve them. For us, at least, the puzzles here were more involved and more difficult than in Black Brim 1876, and this is not a bad thing. A nice step up in difficulty, and I'm sure part of why it takes four hours. If everyone had just plowed through their chosen small puzzle, it would have been a much quicker race to the final meta puzzle. We especially enjoyed that nothing was as easy as it looked like in La Familia. Most of the puzzles had multiple steps. While that first step might be easy, you might look at a puzzle and think, oh, I know exactly what to do. You're going to overlay this over the maze, and then you're going to follow these steps, and done. Well, it ends up, the solution at the end of that just leads you to another puzzle. Now, this was especially true in Part 1. Everything had at least two steps. Now, puzzles in part two did have less steps, but they were more difficult in another way. They were really opaque into what to do to solve them. Here are all these things. What do I do with them? And that's good to hear they weren't all similar. Part two wasn't just more of the same with new clues. Very true. I thought the puzzle balance before between both chapters just felt about right. There was an interesting mix of what you'd expect, right? You've got some logic puzzles. There's a math puzzle, a vocabulary puzzle, 
There was some physical manipulation required, um, observation puzzles where you're trying to spot things, and of course, at least one puzzle. It required some pretty outside-of-the-box thinking, which was good to see. I would say the difficulty seemed pretty constant as well. There was nothing in this box that was super easy to solve. And yes, we had to use a few clues here and there to get through everything in a reasonable amount of time. While I feel like we would have got it eventually, we would have been well past the four-hour time limit. Now, what we did never have to do is look up a final solution. In every case, we were stuck. We looked at one or two early clues that gave us that push to show us what we needed to figure out things on our own. Now, no, Mo did say time limit there, but this isn't a time-based game. Uh, you don't suddenly lose points if you're not if you're done in, in in over four hours. But there is only so much time we have to play games. So <laughs> yeah, the time limit in this case was my kids' bedtime yeah. because we played this on a school night. <laughs> Now, having all the pieces is a nice touch. As, to, as Sadly, we can't say that's been the case for all of the escape-style puzzle games we have been sent. So huh. bravo for that. Now, the best part about La Familia, especially when you compare it to Black Prim 1876, and I'm sorry, they're both in the same company, I can't help but compare them, is the immersion you got while playing this particular game. In Black Brim, you were basically given a bunch of separate puzzles from a Riddler-like character who had nothing really to do with anything in the story. Someone captured cops, we don't know why, and you got to solve all these puzzles to get them free. You, you basically, that was it. There was no real tie-in to what you were solving. It was a puddle, puzzle master presenting you with puzzles. Whereas in La Familia, the clues you are given represent actual physical ciphers that La Familia goons are using to communicate with each other. And that's what they feel like. These feel like things that like physical artifacts of things that could exist in that time period. This is like the poster that's on the wall and near the bathroom, right? It actually has a cipher in it while you have that poster. Now, added to that, the story is based on a real historic period and actual events that happen. The people involved are real people, and the overall case is based on events that actually happen. Now, I wouldn't call a familiar historic game, and I'm pretty sure it's not 100% historically accurate, but the tie-ins to real history does help you feel more immersed in the case. It actually feels like you're solving actual clues and ciphers and not just a bunch of random puzzles put into a box. This one actually interests me more than most of the others we've actually talked about. I'm, I'm not generally all that interested in partaking, and it, it's great that Moa and his uh, his family have been loving these, but I've always been interested in cryptography, and that aspect of this one in particular is something that caught my eye and might catch the eye of others who are interested in puzzles but maybe haven't really found the escape room in a box type to, uh, to their taste yet. Yeah, I almost wish we had kept it replayable, and then you could have at least played around with it. Let's sit down with you, Tori, and Kat as I sit back and snicker because I know the answers. <laughs> Now, one thing my wife did note uh, that did take her out of the immersion is the modern nature of the physical products in La Familia. Well, the newsprint feels like it could be legit. I'm not sure they had thick, glossy cardstock in the 1920s. Having period quality paper would have been a next step that would have made La Familia experience even more engaging and probably would have made things easier to write on. Well, between pricing and resilience of the pieces needing to be manipulated, I'm sure choices were made during manufacturing that uh, put uh, a little bit of this historical accuracy uh, by the wayside. Yes, we have, we have some anachrony in the physical products. Overall, uh, my family really enjoyed La Familia. This is an excellent puzzle-based game that my family had a great time solving together. We loved the way the puzzles were split into individual chunks and the immersion brought in by the puzzles being tied to the late 1920s gangster theme. But we did get stuck a few times. We had to team up on every puzzle, as well as using a few hints. We finished off feeling smart and accomplished. And that's always the feeling you want at the end of a puzzle escape room style experience. Now, if you dig puzzle games that include a wide range of puzzle types, including logic, word, math, and physical puzzles, you should check out La Familia. This is especially true if you dig the Al Capone Roaring Twenties theme as it's integrated so well here. 
Now, what you won't find here is a murder mystery to solve. This is not that kind of puzzle game. This is not a crime scene investigation, a hunt a killer, uh, a mystery evening. This is more of an escape room in a box, though there's no box to escape in this particular case. But it fits that style of game. La Familia is all about solving puzzles and not deducing answers from a variety of different clues. Now, due to its theme integration, the style of puzzles that are in this, I do think this would be a good intro to Puzzling Pursuit style of puzzle games. While we did enjoy Black Brim a lot, we really liked it, the added level of immersion here made this even more engaging and also more memorable. If you don't like puzzles, this isn't going to be a game for you. There's no board game to be seen here, and the story isn't really deep enough to stand as a storytelling experience on its own. You would be better just grabbing a history book or doing some Googling to learn about the period on your own. Well, that's it for our review, review of La Familia, a puzzle game from Puzzling Pursuits, and the first in a trilogy of Chicago-themed games. Have you played any games based on this time period? What's your favorite? Let us know in the comments down below. When you've got time, I invite you to also check out my written review of La Familia over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. If you enjoyed this review, you can show your thanks by thanking, tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. And now the Bellhop's Table Talk, where, table top, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So um, not a lot to talk about tonight. Um, my family is getting over a bout of colds. Uh, that were all passed around to each other. Nothing serious here, no COVID or anything, but it was enough to stop us from getting together to game, uh, especially with other people and with extended family. Now, yesterday, everyone seemed to be doing better, so we headed over to Brenda's to finish off La Familia because I had planned to review that this week. And this way, get for announcing two weeks in a row what we're going to do. Um, I felt obligated to get this done. And, well, it went well, as you heard in the review. Now, the one thing I didn't note in the review that I think is worth bringing up is that upping the difficulty of the puzzles did mean that my youngest, Genevieve, was not able to help nearly as much as she did with Black Brim. Now, I didn't call it out in the review because technically she's not even at the game's recommended age, um, but I think she's definitely smarted for it. But as I've noted before on the show, she does have some processing issues, and that can make various types of puzzles more difficult for her. And I think the puzzles in here were more difficult for her, especially with the multi-steps. She might be able to figure out one part of it, but not got the second part. So again, you know, your mileage may vary, but there is a reason they have chosen 14 plus on there. And it's not yeah. because of small components. Uh, it is because there is a certain level of difficulty involved in this game uh, over and above some others, which maybe you can sort of poke at and, you know, and, and think about enough until they kind of fall into places. This yes. one requires a level of processing. Uh, the other thing I didn't bring up in the review is you you probably will have to Google. <laughs> they they point out you don't have to, but um, I don't know how to word this. I, I don't want to sound. If you have lots of Italian friends and grew up with Italian heritage and Italian slang, you may not have to Google anything. Whereas we definitely did. Right. So there was an aspect of that. I didn't think it was worth bringing out in the review because it mentions it right in the instruction book. Now, the other thing I got played this week was a game of Siege of Valeria. This is the final small box Valeria game we were sent to review. Uh, this is a solo dice driven castle defense game. This is a bunch of cards on the table. You put up your wall. You put up ranks of bad guys who are marching in in five columns with a siege engine at the top. And they slowly start marching in towards you. You roll a bunch of dice. And you use those to try to defeat the enemies. And if you defeat the ones in the front row, which is the vanguard, they don't attack your castle. And then your castle has five different gates. And if there's anyone left at the front row at the end of that in the vanguard, they damage your gate. If any of your gates get hit or towers, I think technically, are hit four times, it collapses and you lose because it's tower defense and all the, the bad guys rush in. Um, cute Valeria things is they talk about the Shadow Kingdoms attacking you, which is a good tie into one of their other games. Um, it does use the whole strength red dice and blue for mana with blue being able to add to red but red not being able to add to blue there are magical enemies that can only defeat it with magic and man the siege engines are nasty so is there a douglas adams theme or did you typo on a tweet earlier today 
I might have typoed on a tweet. I don't know what I tweeted. Because you tweeted that a towel was burned on the field. <laughs> no, that should have been tower. And I, tower. I was really confused until you started describing it right now. And I went, oh, that's a typo. I get yeah. it now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, my all my tweets should go to Deanna first. And she should have to hit like approve before they go out. Uh, no, towers. It's tower defense game. Castle yeah. defense game. You have five towers. I, I don't know. It seemed pretty interesting. Um, I only got into one play. Uh, the art's awesome. Like, like, like this really features Miko's artwork. It's got the awesome iconography we expect from Valeria games. Um, I don't know how Valeria it felt. We were kind of talking about this with the other games. Like, yes, the look was Valeria. And yes, you had the red and the blue. Um, there's champions you hire, but there aren't citizens. I don't know. It, it felt tangentially Valeria. I'd say more so than Thrones, but not much. Well, I mean, it would be hard not to feel more Valeria than Thrones because Thrones didn't feel Valeria even slightly. Exactly. <laughs> That's this. At least I had citizens and the bad guys that were attacking. I recognize all the art from the other games. Like those are monsters you fight in Thrones of Valeria. So th there was definitely some tie-in. Mechanically, though, it did not. It felt like a very standalone, unique game. Um, this is from Glenn of Board Games and Bourbon, a uh, friend of the show, friend of ours online friend haven't met in real life yet it'll happen sometime his first published game and i gotta say for a first published game i'm impressed so good job on that glenn um i do know some of the other valeria team did help with development i don't know how much they did i it seemed neat now i lost pretty badly um and it was 100 percent due to not knowing the cards like i was going around good it looked like it was going really well done but i missed that a particular siege engine called ogre's reach which seems to be like a giant Albert on a swing that cut through walls. I don't know, it looked neat. Um, was going to add two flame tokens to a wall that already had two on it. And if you get four flame tokens on a wall, you lose. And if I had noticed this, I could have used uh, easily, like the, the, the basic thing I could have done is I had a champion that if I flip it, I can move a token. Well, I did that to a different wall. So if I'd just done it on this wall, I would have still been alive. Plus, if I was paying attention, I took out three siege engines that turn. I could have just took that one out. But it was one of those, there's a ton of cards in front of you. And, and and there's a lot going on. That's fair. Yeah, no, it's it's I, I, games like this. It's really hard to grasp everything that's going on on that first time through, and you're yeah. almost certain to miss some combo that eventually will become a routine part of the game. But yeah. until then, <laughs> well, oh shoot, but yeah, oh shoot. Well, that was it, right? I'm like, oh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And then I'm like, wait, ah. Oh. I didn't even like I, earlier in the same round, I used a card that was ignore a siege attack on something else that did something I thought was bad, but it wasn't as bad as losing the game. Like, I, I have a feeling that like we're going to give this a few more plays. Obviously, I'd like Sean to try it before we do a formal review. I want to get some more plays in this. In, but I have a feeling the biggest issue we're going to have with this game is just that there's so much going on. Like you have 25 cards in front of you. Plus, you have cards in your hands. Later, once you defeated Siege Engines, you're putting out random champions, each with their own powers. That's just a lot to look at at once. Now, thankfully, the generic mobs, which take up the first four rows at the start of the game, don't do anything when coming up. They're just there to be defeated. And if they reach you, it's bad. But once you defeat them, they become in your hand, and that's where all your dice manipulation comes in. So it's not like you can ignore them, but it's at least like you really should focus on the Siege Engines. I don't know. There, there's just a lot of stuff. And I think it's just a matter of experience. Eventually, excuse me. I'm sorry about that. Eventually, you're just going to get used to the cards and what you can do with them. And it'll probably speed up a lot as well. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, did, and we got the expansion for this as well, right? Yeah, I haven't. I, I have the expansion. We, we have an unboxing for it even to publish, which we haven't done yet. I haven't tried the expansion, obviously, because I just played the core game. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting because the expansion, as well as adding more content, is a uh, legacy or not legacy? Um, a campaign, yeah, campaign. game. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's uh, I'm I'm just sort of I just sort of glanced over a few notes on board game arena, uh, and it's 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 interesting what people have to say about about the game in general. <laughs> just okay, it's it's rated solidly, but I think I, I think most people are finding that it wears a little thin until you add that extra the campaign campaign in there where it becomes a a more well rounded game right. worthy of longer play and to so. be on like like anyone who backed the kickstarter got both together yeah so 
and I don't know how it's going to be sold separately. Still, these games are still showing us like you can't get them on Amazon. So I don't know what's going on with the distribution of these. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I I, I do like that I didn't win on my first try. That that would have actually soured me on the game. I would have been, you know what? This seems way too easy because my first time sitting down to play when I didn't know any of the cards or what could possibly happen, I won. So I, I feel kind of good that I, I got like lamb basted like four turns in and out of seven. So I, I think solo games need to have difficulty like they you need uh, you need that close to winning right feeling without winning you, you want hope you want hope without uh either yeah. disappointment at the ease or complete and utter yeah. you know, <laughs> giving up exactly plus i think it was really positive i know what i did wrong yeah. like like I, I could see at least four different things i could have done to prevent that if i was paying attention now i should have done what most solo gamers do and go okay we're just going to move that flame token over here and keep playing <laughs> but I fear for my first play, I would at least try to stick to raw and not cheat. Fair enough. Uh, as for me, I've been working lots uh, in between that and family and you're being sick. Uh, I've gotten zip zero zilch yeah. board gaming in. So you doing any board game arena still or no? Uh, some, uh, but we're down to just a few kind of, of the regular, yeah. the regular stuff that the, the donuts and, and whatnot donuts and sushi. Uh, oh, hey, go nuts for donuts and sushi. Go. The Go Games. Yep. So uh, that's it for what we've been playing. What about what we have coming up next? All right. So we did not get in the gaming that was expected last week. So I don't think that's going to totally mess up our plan, our schedule that we had going. So the plan is still to cover board game expansions next Wednesday, um, which is going to mean trying to fit in as many expansion plays as we can before then. So that's something, as far as I know, everyone's coming over Friday, so we're good then. Sean, you're in town this weekend. Mm -hmm. We might we might be able to toss in. We should be going to Brenda's on Sunday. Maybe we can toss in an extra game night or two there as well. Um, I don't have anything really, I don't know. We got to look at our calendar, <laughs> see what's going on. But hopefully maybe maybe we can squeeze some game in on Thursday, Thursday and Saturday as well this week. Uh, and Mon Monday is Easter holidays, so there's no, uh, there's no school. Yeah, that's true. The kids will be home Friday and Monday, so... Mm -hmm. And, and at least one of the games I want to play, too, actually, the kids enjoy. So that might work, because my goal right now is the Shadow Kingdoms of Valyria Rise of Titans expansion, because it's been on our pile of obligation far too long. I want to get that one out. The Winter expansion for Dice Kingdoms of Valyria, which I feel I could right now, um, and we could probably review no problem. So I think that's a guaranteed for next Wednesday, though I would like one or two more plays just to kind of fine-tune our thoughts. Uh, the Turning a Tide expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena, which, again, I feel I could write something now, but there might be a little bit more to discover there. Like Sean, I want to play against the new characters instead of playing them. Um, and then the other one, if we have time, we'll try to get in the B-movie expansion for Roll Camera. So that might jump up because that's another one that we can play five. So that might actually jump up because we could play that Friday as well as Sunday because uh, my in-laws actually really enjoyed Roll Camera. So. That's the goal. We'll see. I, I'm not going to promise anything this week. We weren't expecting colds. So you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> this show wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. So here's a quick shout out to five of them. Dean Graham. Thank you. And David Miller Jr. Thank you. Brian Kurtz, who I think actually was in the chat tonight. I saw a rare Brian sighting. Thank you, Brian. Jeff, Sheila, and Clara Seuss, thank you. Pat and Tori, baby's coming soon. Cat's off work. We're in the final stretch. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. If you enjoy the content we put out each week, including this podcast and the reviews and other content that goes out on the blog, you can show your support at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live. And be sure to stick around for the Penthouse After Show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. Game on.